All right, good morning. Good morning. All right, we're going to get started this morning, and uh, appreciate you being here today. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, I'd like to just start off by saying I really want to say thank you to Noah and his uh, crew. They came out and uh, sealed the uh, parking lot for us and um, did a great job. Uh, appreciate what, uh, Brother Noah, I appreciate what you did outside this week. <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, uh, and I know uh, Mike went and helped us pick up some of the, uh, we utilized his trailer well this week, picking up some of the uh, sealant, but appreciate the help this week. 
also had a lot of hands uh, helping with our uh, fall festival. And our fall festival is next Saturday, or this Saturday, not next Saturday, it's this Saturday already, goodness gracious. Uh, a week from yesterday, uh, we'll have the fall festival out here. And uh, how many have been waiting till the last second to sign up to help? I hope a bunch of you just raise your hand, right? Uh, all right. Uh, we need uh, as many people to sign up on the way out today uh, to help with that. Uh, all you got to do is sit there and watch somebody throw darts and kill somebody, all right? Uh, it's not a big deal. If you got a phone, you can dial 911, you're, you're in, all right? And, uh, but, uh, but we're going to have a good time. Uh, we, got a, we have a hay ride that's going to take people to the back side of the property. Uh, they're going to go back there. Uh, they're going to stop in front of a puppet stage, and uh, they're going to hear a clear presentation of the gospel. And uh, we look forward to that. Uh, then there's going to be a craft show going on back there under the pavilion. So if you like crafty things, I think there's some people in here that are going to have some tables set up. Uh, that'll be back there. Uh, then we'll be, uh, we have several inflatables coming, and then uh, we've been uh, building games. We've got a shooting gallery. Uh, that one's going to be, uh, I think we're only going to keep it to 9 millimeter. Uh, we decided not to do the 38 millimeter, uh, 9 millimeter, right? Uh, that way if somebody gets shot, we just take them to the hospital. Uh, but anyways, uh, we've got a shooting gallery. We've got a duck pond. We have uh, all kinds of games that will be set up in the parking lot back there. Uh, and so we look forward to having you come and help and participate. be a great time. Weather's supposed to be 71 degrees and partly cloudy, all right? So perfect fall festival weather, uh, not too hot, not too cold, so we look forward uh, to that. Appreciate all the, all the help getting ready for it, all right? Uh, we're going to stand together, and we're going to sing Nothing But the Blood. Be praying for Chris today. He's out singing. Uh, they're out singing at the church today. Uh, so the ladies are going to help us today. Nothing But the Blood of Jesus.
Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. This time we're going to have Brother Ed come, and he's leading our prayer team right now, and Miss Kelly. Uh, actually, Miss Kelly, would you take a minute to, when you're up here, and just uh, share with the church about your son so the church could be praying for him? And, uh, but anyways, they're, they're heading up our prayer team right now, and uh, they want to give an update on that. And uh, so, Brother Ed, if you would come, and Miss Kelly, and, uh, and uh, give us that update. And uh, so that we can we can know what's going on with the with the prayer group. Thanks, Pastor. What's going on with the prayer group? First, the prayer group is George and Kathy. Jerrica Cameron will be joining us this coming week. Kelly and myself. A week ago Wednesday, we uh, had the opportunity to go outside and pray with the. Uh, going group in the fall festival, prayed that uh, safety for all the workers, prayed that uh, the upcoming fall festival would uh, not only bring in a lot of uh, members of the community, everyone would have a good time, but uh, God and his glory would be revealed. It would be very successful that people would, in our community would come to know God, his glory, and uh, maybe even come to visit us, come to know us, and most importantly, come to know God. Before Kelly tells you about her son and what we did last Wednesday, I'm going to ask you to pray for what we're going to do this upcoming Wednesday, which we'll be meeting here and praying for boldness. So what does that mean exactly? The church today needs boldness more than ever. We can't sit here and just rest on our salvation. Isaiah calls, Isaiah 5, I think, go woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. That is happening all over the place. Uh, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I read this last week, and it happened in Ohio. Northern Ohio, a lady cut off the head of a fiance's pet pig and she's looking at 50 years in jail yet yet you can kill innocent babies all day long put, put the baby in the trash or even worse than that and you'll be lifted up you'll be lifted up as a hero and these women will 
go on the news and scream, no one's going to tell me what to do with my body. I, I mean, to say that today, they must be from Mars. But, but these are the things that we see happening. I'll tell you another real quick story. Now, now, people don't admit these things, but when you take a survey, they'll admit it. This is sad, but over 50% of the people in the clergy, pastorate, whatever you want to call it, don't believe in the virgin birth. So Jude tells us we have to contend for the faith. So this is how we need to be bold. We have to contend for the faith once delivered. No additions, no subtractions, once delivered unto the saints. So how do we contend? You, I've been hearing this a l for years that, that people don't believe in the virgin birth. Well, you know, I just say that's somewhat confusing to me. So, so if you believe that God and Jesus did miracles, but you believe that, but you just don't believe in the virgin birth. So exactly how does that work? Do you believe in miracles, but you don't believe in that miracle? So you think that God is powerful and God can do miracles. He just couldn't do that miracle. But this is clearly in the Bible. So, But you believe the Bible, you just don't believe that part. So, again, we need to be bold when we hear these things, when we see these things. We need to contend for the faith without being contentious, but... We no longer can sit in the pews and just ignore these kind of things. So we're going to be praying for boldness Wednesday night. And bef between now and then, we're going to ask for your prayers. And Kelly's going to tell you that we, how we were blessed this last Wednesday. Okay. So last week, we went to visit some cutting um, deer in Flint. They actually were able to come to the picnic, which was a huge blessing. We want to be a blessing to them, but oh my goodness gracious, all of us there walked away with a few blessings. Um, we want to pray with them, ask them what kind of needs they might have had or whatever, but just to, just to see um, their love for each other, but more importantly, their love for God. It was truly a blessing. Um, Mr. Clint was saying how that they go out and people will pay for the meals or people have given them money for or paid for the groceries and different things. And he's like, I don't know why people do that. And I was saying, because this world is hurting so bad, it is a blessing to see a couple who truly loves each other, but there's also something about you. Knowing, if you know uh, Miss Vera and Mr. Clint, they love God, and it is, it is shown through them. And, and the world needs to see that. So it was a blessing for him to tell us on how that they have been out and how they have been blessed, but I don't think he really realizes how he's blessing others when they go out. It's very cute. He takes Miss Vera, puts her in a little wheelchair, and they go out for walks. Um, it, was, it was just, you just had to be there. It gives me goosebumps talking about it. But it was truly a blessing. And then listen to Mr. Clint. Um, as you know, Edward loves the Bible, and he loves to ask people questions about the Bible. And Mr. Clint would just very say, well, what about this? And he would just very simply give an explanation on something. It was just truly, truly a blessing. So um, remember our shut-ins, as um, if those of you that don't know, but we, that is something that we're going to try to do is go out and visit our shut-ins, actually do a little visit with them and stuff also. Um, so hopefully you guys can kind of understand how, what a blessing it was for us to be there. Um, Pastor asked me to say something real quick about my son. Um, his name is Stephen. He has been um, tested, I don't know when, but he was tested um, for COVID. Um, he has COVID um, pneumonia now. Quick scenarios is he had been sick apparently for a while. He's a man, doesn't want to tell anybody, so he was sicker than he knew. His wife has been out of town going to school, so it was kind of like a perfect storm. Um, anyway, what happened was he's now in the hospital because he had fallen. He's got stitches in his head. He was unconscious. Um, his blood pressure, his um, blood sugar's high, his blood pressure's low. He was on oxygen. Praise God he's off oxygen um, last night, but he is in ICU. So if you think about him, we don't know exactly all what's going on. He, he knows he knows God, praise God, um, but we all know who the ultimate physician is. So just pray for him, and his name is Stephen. Thank you. This next song is a new one. We can stand and join together. Follow along and join in when you feel like you're ready. Thank you. 
Strong team.
Amen. Glad to be here today. You glad to be here today? Amen. Say amen. amen. All right. Hopefully you got your nap in during Sunday school. Amen. And uh, now the church has started. Uh, you're, you're alert. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to John chapter number 12. Um, I don't know if all public speakers go through this or if I'm just weird, but um, it's funny because every... Every once in a while, you'll, you'll have this dream, and uh, you'll be dreaming that you're up preaching in front of church, and uh, your pants fall down. Uh, or, uh, or you'll be thinking, like, you'll be preaching, and, you know, you uh, bend over, and your pants will split. Or you're always, like, like, sometimes I wake up, and I'm in, like, a sweat, you know? And I realize, oh, it's just a dream. Thank you, Lord. And uh, I had one of those just a couple days ago, and so this morning, I made sure that my threads were good. <laughs> Um, and uh, we were up in Sunday school this morning, and uh, we were playing some musical chairs, and Stephen split his pants all the way down the side, and uh, so I guess I should have reminded him this morning uh, that that might be a possibility, amen, uh, but anyways, uh, we had a good time up in the youth group this morning, appreciate you bringing your teenagers to Sunday school, uh, I love uh, being able to teach uh, the teenagers um, the God's word, and uh, and uh, just, we need a generation of teenagers that loves God again, amen? amen. I tell you what, we've, we've, we've had several generations now, it feels like, that they, uh, they are not seeking after God. They get out of high school, and I'm not saying all, I'm just saying that there's, a, there's the last several generations, there's just not a yearning and not a desire to serve God and to love God with, with all their heart. And uh, would to God that we would have a new generation now of young people that would say, uh, I love God and I want to serve him. However that is, I just want to serve him. And uh, that's what my prayer is for our teenagers here. Uh, and um, I want to talk to you this morning about this subject, uh, if I could, the legacy of Mary. The legacy of Mary. Uh, normally, and this is, I'm not uh, re re referencing here Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, but Mary, the sister of Martha, and oftentimes we don't hear about Mary until about December, amen? Uh, December, everybody starts talking about Mary, and then we forget about her for 11 months, but that's not the Mary we're talking about. Uh, but I, uh, I want to talk about the legacy uh, of Mary, and, and by way of introduction, last week was the birthday of our church, and uh, we, uh, we celebrated after church, we went out and ate some food together, and, and, and last week I tried to convey two important thoughts that I felt like uh, this church ought to be known for, and uh, some things that we should be striving for as a church body, and they were this, to have the presence of Jesus in our lives in church, and, and, and as a spiritual body, we should be pursuing his mission, and uh, so we need the presence of Jesus in our lives and in our church, and, 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 and then we need to be pursuing the mission that God has given us uh, to do, and today I would like to give you a practical example of this in the Bible, if I could, and so if I uh, not really a continuation of last week as much as an application of what we learned last week that we see in the life of someone here in the Bible. And so, uh, in the, it, it, just by way of context, it's the, it's the final week before the cross. Uh, in this passage, John pauses to record a story that happened on the Saturday night before the triumphal entry. And uh, we're now just days away from the kiss of betrayal of Judas and days away from the crucifixion of our Lord. Uh, and, and John pauses to tell us uh, the story of a woman named Mary uh, who anointed uh, the feet of Jesus. And, uh, and so her story is included in Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to bounce around to some of these other passages to kind of give you the full context. Uh, but their story is included in Matthew 26, Mark 14. And then here in John chapter number 12. Uh, but as familiar as we are with what she did, uh, her actions are not what I would like to focus on this morning. Uh, oftentimes when we talk about Mary, we kind of focus on the fact that she washed Jesus' feet and anointed him uh, there with oil. And, 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 and she did those things. Uh, but but, but, but I, I, that's not what I want to focus on this morning. I'm challenged by something that Jesus said about her actions. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. Uh, hold your finger here in John and turn with me over to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, I should have told you that earlier. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 13. We're going right back to John, so keep your finger there. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 13, the Bible says this. In verse 13, truly, 
I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Jesus said, you'll never tell my story without talking about her. That's what he says. You'll never tell my story without talking about her. And you'll never tell her story without talking about me. What a legacy. What a legacy. I want, I, want, I want you to let that sink in. Jesus says, you'll never tell my story without talking about her. And you'll never tell her story without talking about me. I want to look at a few aspects of the life of Mary this morning. Uh, with you if I could number one I want you if you're taking notes I want you to write this down Mary was a simple girl Mary was a simple girl back over in the book of John back over in the book of John in chapter number 12 we're going to see that Uh, Mary uh, there's not much uh, honestly there's not much that just uh, jumps out of the page of the Bible about Mary other than the fact that she anointed uh, Jesus, uh, she was kind of the simple girl. She was always in the background. Uh, look at John chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible says this, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And uh, there made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And then took Mary a pound of ointment, of spike nerd and very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment we don't know a lot about her except for her name her hometown the fact that she enjoyed spending uh, time with Jesus and uh, her resume isn't really all that that long and as a matter of fact you never really see her utter any words in this passage but even without uttering any words she causes quite a stir and, uh, and you're going to see that. Uh, I want you to go, go, go from here. Go with me to Luke chapter 10. Hold your finger here and go with me to Luke chapter 10. Uh, I want you to see the stir that she caused without even speaking a word. She literally walks in and, and anoints Jesus. Uh, and, 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 and look at the stir. She says nothing that we know of. Uh, she walks in very quietly uh, and does this. And in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38... I want you to see the stir that this causes. The Bible says, verse 38, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha uh, received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she should help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. You see, when you compare Mary to Martha, many uh, would love to identify with Martha. Martha's the gifted one. She's always busy serving people, and there's nothing wrong with that, but even Martha is somewhat miffed at, at what Mary is doing. And, and if there's something that we can learn, it is this. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Our great God specializes in calling ordinary people. Uh, 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this. For, for ye seeing your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty not many noble are called but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen yea and things which are not to bring to not things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence I I, I thank God that God loves ordinary people God loves simple people. I'm not down on education and I'm not down on training, but God is down on self-sufficiency. I want to say that again. Education and training are not bad, but God does not like self-sufficiency. He doesn't like you doing things in your own strength. He doesn't like you doing things out of your own wisdom. All right? Uh, 
God's not a talent scout looking for a good recruit. He's a sovereign God looking for empty vessels that he can fill and use for his own glory. You see, we oftentimes we look around and it's a dog and pony show and oh, that one's that one's uh, that one knows uh, a lot and this one's smart and that one has this talent and this one has that talent. And God says, sometimes I'm just looking for an empty vessel for which I can fill. Why? Why we got to do that? He tells us there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 29, because he wants no flesh to glory. He doesn't want you to be able to glory at what you know or what you can do or how smart you are or how gifted you are. You can play four instruments. Some of us can't play one. Amen. He doesn't want us to glory in those things. He wants us to glory in him. There were dozens of highly trained theologians in Mary's day, but we don't know any of their names. But here we are nearly 2,000 years later studying the life of this simple girl who served a sovereign God. You know, Mary's just a, one of the countless examples of a nobody that God used. To leave a legacy, you have to be empty. To leave a legacy, you have to be pliable. To leave a legacy, you have to be moldable. You have to be weak so that God can use you for his glory and that you don't take the glory from the Lord. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 8, we're told that this simple lady had done what she could. But God used her in even a greater way. You see, one of the great tragedies of life is to see a person who does nothing because they can do a little. Only can, they, because they can only do a little. Why? Well, I'm not going to do nothing because I don't have a lot to offer God. I, I just have a little. You know what? A bunch of people doing a little, God puts that all together and uses it for his glory. See, if you can do a lot, it's hard because you, oftentimes the more that you can do, the more glory you like to take. But God says, I don't want you, I don't want the flesh to glory. And so he uses the weak things, he uses the broken things, he uses the, uh, the, 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 the foolish things so that the wise are confounded. But not only do we see the simple girl, we see, I want you to see this, we see the spiritual gratitude uh, in her life. In John, back in John chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And there made him a supper, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. If you were to go back and you were to read chapter 11, chapter 11 uh, talked about the death of Lazarus. And uh, that was the, 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 the brother there of Mary and Martha, and they were, they were, they were extremely sad and brokenhearted uh, about his death. And, and Jesus came and met him, and they said, uh, Jesus, if you'd have been here, he would not have died. And what happens? Jesus comes to the tomb and speaks some words and Lazarus comes forth out of the grave and in the, in the very next chapter, in chapter 12, he's sitting here at the feet of Jesus. Do you think Martha, or do you think Mary had some gratitude to the Lord? You think there was a little bit inside of Mary that wanted to kind of sit there uh, at the feet of Jesus with, with, uh, with, with uh, 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 his name just slipped my mind. Lazarus. You think there was some? Uh, you think there was part of her that wanted to to be there with Lazarus and um, at the feet of Jesus and just and just kind of show gratitude for all that God had done in her life and maybe in the life of Lazarus. I believe that we see some spiritual uh, some spiritual gratitude. Uh, and, and, and matter of fact, if you go down to verse nine, it tells us that many uh, of the Jews had come because they wanted to see Lazarus, who had just been raised. Uh, from the dead this has caused a stir in the town and I can't help but believe that she sat there and she heard Lazarus laughing and saw the crowds coming that, 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 that she had some gratitude in her heart for all that the Lord had done and it, you know it would do us all some good uh, to have and show some gratitude to Christ for who he is and all that he has done and I'm not talking about our cars and our houses and those kind of things I'm talking about the fact that he breathed into us eternal life 
I'm talking about the fact that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and he came and he quickened us and he made us alive. Uh, and, and in essence, that's what he did to Lazarus, and that's what, uh, that's what uh, uh, we should be grateful for, uh, that we have been quickened, that we've been made alive. You know, if your service to Christ is ever motivated, motivated by anything other than grace, it won't last. But I want to say, if your service to Christ is motivated by grace, you also can't sit in apathy. It's impossible. How can I not study the Word of God? How could I not worship and sing? How could I not teach my children the commandments of God? How could I not want to tell others about what Christ has done for me? How could I not want to join a mission group on a Wednesday night? How could I not want to come up and put some physical labor in so that the place that we meet in looks like we care about the one that we came to worship? How could I not want to come and serve in a fall festival where Christ is being presented to a community? How could I not want to come and welcome some family from a foreign country and build a relationship with them and be the first person that's ever maybe presented Christ to them? How could I not want to be a part of being involved in a greater way in the lives of the missionaries that we've committed to help send across the globe? How could I not want to come and be a part of praying and asking God to do a mighty work around our world for the cause of Christ and for his glory. How could I not want to come and learn more about God's plan and mission for this world? You see, there's a song that says, I was shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. You see, when the day, if you've ever been touched by Jesus, the day he touched you, you go to a point where you say, how could I not but do these things because of how great the God is that saved me and loved me? And How could I not? How could I not come and, and worship the one that bought me with his blood, purchased me, paid my sin debt? You see, I think, that, I think that if we're going to be, I think if we're going to be a spiritual body of believers that are coming together for the mission and we're going to seek God's presence among us, I think we've got to be quick uh, to take, to take the, our praises to him and, and, and our worship to him and our service to him because we owe it all to him. And that's what we're going to get into next. I want you to look at this third thought, the symbolic gift in John Chapter 12 and verse 3, the Bible says, And Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard and very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor uh, of the ointment. Somehow Mary seemed to know that the cross was approaching. She had spiritual insight because she'd sat at his feet and we, we know this story is pointing to the, to the cross of Christ because the Christ of the cross uh, in the Christ of the cross, because everything in the book of John does, if you were to turn in John chapter th 20 and verse 31, it says, but these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. You see, when we read the Bible, we wonder how the disciples missed that. But Mary seems to have gotten it. Her life, her memory, her legacy... It was all connected to Calvary. To leave a legacy, you have to point people to the cross. If we're gonna, if we're gonna be part of the mission and we're gonna, we're gonna have God's presence among us, we have to be pointing people to the cross. You cannot say that you're involved in the mission if nothing in your life is pointing people to the cross. She pointed people to the cross. John tells us that this ointment could have been sold for 300 pence or denarii. This was about a year's uh, wages for, uh, for labor. And, uh, you know, as we look at this, maybe we, maybe we think like the, the, the other disciples did, like, man, what a waste. But why is it not wasteful to spend a year's salary in a moment like this? Why is that not wasteful? The answer is this, because waste is determined by who the gift is for and what the gift is for. <laughs> I'm going to say this again. Waste is determined by who the gift is for and what the gift is for. One of the greatest hymn writers 
of all time wrote this uh, song about surveying and contemplating the cross uh, of Jesus. And he wrote, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. You see, her gift, it wasn't for Lazarus. If she was giving it to Lazarus, it may have been considered a waste. If she was giving it, if she was giving it to one of the other disciples, it may have been considered a waste. But it wasn't considered a waste because she gave it to Jesus. You see, have you given your all to Jesus? Does Jesus have your life? But amongst this we see, number four, we see a sarcastic group. In John chapter 12 and verse 4, the Bible says, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. That's all, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that the one that's getting ready to portray Jesus is the one that says this. But it says in verse 5, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put there. In other words, he had what he was getting ready to betray Jesus with right there in his pocket. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. So we see this sarcastic group. Matter of fact, um, her act of worship literally split the crowd in two. Jesus has always been a divisive figure. If you're going to live for him, then you have to be ready to endure criticism. Period. The only way to never be criticized is to say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. But I'll be honest with you, if you do that, then get ready to be criticized by Jesus. Mary says, I'd rather be criticized for doing something for Jesus than to be criticized by Jesus for doing nothing. You remember the, the ones that, that he gave talents to? Uh, and uh, uh, the one guy, buried, he, he buried his talent and he did nothing. And who did Jesus come back and criticize? He came back and criticized the one that did nothing. Some people are afraid of being seen as zealots. Some people are afraid that their kids are going to turn out weird if they raise them up to love Jesus. I would say this, we're a long way from being too radically in love with Jesus. <laughs> we're a long ways away from being too radically in love with Jesus. If you go back and you study the, the New Testament scriptures in the Bible, uh, I mean, uh, a radical look like uh, shaking a snake off of their arm. Uh, Paul shaking a snake off of his arm while he's serving Jesus Christ. It, it radically was, was being shipwrecked and getting back up and still going to the next town. Radical was being stoned and left outside for dead and getting up and shaking it off and going to the next town. Uh, radical was being thrown in prison. And while you're in prison, I'm going to write some scriptures of the Bible that the Lord tells me to write. I mean, radical was being beaten uh, to the point of almost death and still saying, I love Jesus, and I'm going to go on a missionary journey and tell the world about him. I don't think any of us in this room this morning are anywhere near being accused of being too radically in love with Jesus Christ. Most critics will grumble about the way that you're doing something that they're not doing at all. <laughs> I always love that. Well, pastor, what are you doing going door to door? You know that doesn't work anymore. What are you doing? Right? right? People grumble about everything that you're doing, but oftentimes do nothing. They may criticize your approach to soul winning, but they've never led anyone to Jesus. They criticize the Sunday school teacher, but they've never taught a class. They criticize the way a ministry gets done, but they're never there to participate in said ministry. You see, they may criticize your approach to discipling your kids, but they're not training theirs at all. And oftentimes theirs are, are gone in the world. And I would say this, you can't, uh, you can't be a Christian and not have criticism. There's always going to be a sarcastic group all around you. All around you, you're going to deal with sarcastic 
people. To leave a legacy, you have to overlook the negative responses uh, of the lost people around you, and you have to overlook the negative responses of the spiritually immature people around you. Just because somebody's a Christian doesn't make them mature. There's a lot of Christians in this world today that are spiritually immature. They're still drinking milk. They're still eating graham crackers. Amen. And, and often, I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to judge. I'm just saying we have a lot of people around us that aren't solid uh, Christians eating the meat of the word of God. And oftentimes, that's where we get our criticism from. And you've got to ignore that. You can't, you can't quit because of criticism. Remember what Nehemiah said in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? In other words, Nehemiah is saying, uh, what good is it going to do me to come listen to your criticisms? <laughs> right? By the way, the criticism is coming from the disciples here. John says it started with Judas, but Matthew and Mark if you go back to their accounts, it tells us it spread amongst the others. And when you give your all to Jesus, somebody's going to say, what a waste. What a wasted education. What a wasted giftedness, uh, that, that talent that you had. What a wasted life. But it all depends on your perspective of the worth of Jesus. You see, for most people, uh, giving your life to God or giving your talents to God or giving your energy and service to God it's a waste because they don't see Jesus as valuable. But when you recognize Jesus as the creator of the universe, who didn't judge people and send people to hell, but came and died on the cross so that the world through him might be saved, and that he loves people enough that he organized a church to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth so that every tongue and tribe and nation could know what he did for them on the cross. When you realize that God loves the world that much, when you see the worth of Jesus Christ, it changes your perspective on whether what you're giving him is a waste or not. But then there was a, the last thing that we see here, and that's this, it was a singular goal. There was a singular goal. John chapter 12, verse 8. Verse 9, the Bible says, For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he hath raised from the dead. I want you to look at the defense of Jesus. Jesus said, back up in verse 7, Jesus said, Let her alone. Leave her alone. Judas says, it's wasteful. Jesus says, it's wonderful. Let her alone. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 13, we read it at the very beginning. It says, verily I say unto you, wheresoever the gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. This gospel shall be preached in the whole world. Leave her alone. What she is doing will be shared with the whole world as the gospel is proclaimed. What a legacy. What a legacy. She pursued the approval of Jesus as her only standard of success. Mary held nothing back. She wasn't a one day a week believer. She gave everything to the Lord. You know, some people say, well, if Mary was smart, she would have taken her alabaster box and she'd have shaved about 10% of it off. I'll keep 90, give, give the Lord 10. But Mary understood the worth of her Savior. He says, leave her alone. The key to leaving a legacy is to do what you can, when you can, all you can, every time you can. She couldn't do everything, but she did what she could and she did it for the Lord she did it because she loved the Lord I want to sum it up this way if I can God can use me for his glory in the light of what he's done for me I will serve him nothing is too lavish for a God who would redeem me I will turn a deaf ear a blind eye and a thick skin to the world and I will seek the pleasure and glory of Jesus above all else
Would you make that your prayer this morning? You see, this is a great example of seeking the presence of God in your life and pursuing his mission as part of the body of Christ. Realizing that God can use me for his glory and the light of what he's done for me, I will serve him. Nothing is too lavish for a God who would redeem me. I'll turn a deaf ear and a blind eye and a thick skin to the world, and I will seek the pleasure and glory of Jesus above all else. What a legacy from a simple girl that we're still talking about today. You know, this could be our legacy. It could be my legacy. It could be your legacy if we'll apply these truths. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer this morning, and Lord, we ask you to, to help us. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to take this example that we find of Mary in the Bible, Lord, that we would apply it, Lord, that we would look at the wisdom, Lord, that she had in her life, but Lord, that we would see and focus on your response that it pleased you. Lord, there's so much that we don't do for you because we don't see and value your worth. For most professing believers, you're a genie in the bottle that we call on whenever we need something, but for the most part, don't value you, Lord, as we should. We don't see you for how holy and how great and how majestic you are. We don't see you as creator and sustainer of this world and life. God, I pray that you'd help us to see how, how great you are, how valuable you are, so that, Lord, we would understand that you're worthy of everything that we have, not just what's convenient, not what's left over, but you're worthy of everything. Lord, help us, I pray, in this time of reflection. Lord, may we search our hearts. May we, may we see, Lord, if there's anything in our life that's holding us back. We'll thank you and praise you for it. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. With our heads bowed and no one looking around, we're just going to have a time of reflection and we're not going to sing we're just going to have a time of prayer if you want to come this morning and pray you're welcome to if you want to pray in your pew there and ask God to help you you're welcome to do that also if you're here and you'd like somebody to pray with you you're welcome to do that I'll be standing up here in the front we'd be glad to pray with you if you're here and you're not saved you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your savior you don't know that you're on your way to heaven and you don't even know you're not mad at God but you don't know that you don't know if somebody was to ask you why God would even let you into heaven you don't even know what your answer would be this morning I want you to come and let someone take the word of God and show you what it means to be saved maybe you just want to spend time talking to the God about your relationship with him whatever the case may be you you reflect there where you're at or if you want to come you come as we take the next few minutes this morning to search our hearts
right. Um, we're going to take up our offering this morning. If the men would make their way to the front, we'll receive our tithes and offerings. Appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, we're not here just to see how much money we can get out of people. The Lord was very clear in his Bible that we're to give our first fruits to him. That's the first 10% of everything that we that we make. And so uh, that's what my family, we do. We give back the first 10%. And oftentimes the Bible says that you give above and beyond that. And we, we try to do that also. But, uh, but I appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. Everything that's used goes to helping sustain this church and reaching our community and the world with the gospel. And uh, we try to make sure we manage those funds uh, to the best of our ability. And uh, there's a lot of kind of ability with that. And so we, we thank the Lord uh, for all the men he's put in place in this church to help administrate. And uh, we, don't, we don't talk about that group often, um, but, uh, but we do appreciate all the ones that, that help with the administration of the finances of the church. And I appreciate that. I have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our offering this morning. And uh, brother, brother Ed, if you would, uh, would you say a prayer blessing? Uh, just a couple of announcements. Right across the hall in Coombs Chapel, that's what we call it. Um, I, oftentimes new people ask me, why do you call it Coombs Chapel? Uh, well, um, the guy that donated all the property to the church um, back a long time ago, uh, his name was Mr. Coombs. And uh, so when they built the original building there uh, and then turned it into a chapel, they named it after him. So we always have called it Coombs Chapel. But for anybody that's visiting, that may sound weird. Um, Coombs Chapel, right? Where'd you come up with that name? Uh, so anyways, um, uh, but right across the hall, it's just right across the hall, there's two doors that go in. Uh, there are some shelves on the, on the, on the wall. You, I can see them from here, uh, but they, uh, they contain now. Uh, and I want to say thank you to John. He's not here today, but uh, thank you to John. He built the shelves for us in there. And then our sending team put together binders for each of our missionaries uh, that we support. Uh, so there's information about them in there. There's prayer letters in there. Uh, all the information that we've assembled for each of our missionaries are in those binders. So we want to encourage people uh, that, that, to, to take time. Uh, I know it's in an odd spot, but it was kind of the best place for us to be able to put it. Uh, but take the time to go in there and, uh, and grab those notebooks. There's tables and chairs in there. You can sit after church, before church, uh, go through those, read about them, uh, keep up to date with what's going on with our missionaries. And, uh, and then uh, also... Uh, we had sent out a uh, message a couple weeks ago 
about getting some gift cards for our missionaries. Uh, and uh, so uh, I have a note that says that we want to get those by October the 3rd. All right. So I don't know if anybody's gone out and bought any of those yet. Uh, but if you can, I just want to, as a reminder, uh, get some gift cards and get them to the sending team, uh, which is Miss Michelle, Brother David, uh, Miss Connie, or um, Brother Brian, uh, and, uh, and, and there's others, Miss Heidi. Uh, get, them to, get the cards to one of them, but, but if you could, um, be, be, uh, we want to make sure that we're a blessing to our missionaries, and those cards will be again being sent out by October the third, so we need them by then, all right? I appreciate all your help. If you've not signed up yet for the fall festival, which is this coming Saturday, do that on your way out the door today, and I appreciate everybody being here. You are dismissed. Uh, tonight, uh, oh, wait, one more, one more announcement. Uh, tonight, everything's normal. We'll have our uh, WANA program, all that, but uh, next Sunday, uh, we have a singing uh, a couple that's going to be with us. And uh, they, uh, just a husband and wife, and they, they play and sing. They're actually going to do the whole service. And uh, they're going to present the gospel through song and testimony. And, uh, and it's going to be a blessing to you. Uh, but, but I just wanted to remind you, if you know somebody that's not in church, next week sometimes music's an avenue to get, get, to get somebody exposed to the gospel. And so uh, we want to we try to do that next week, invite them. Uh, make sure you're going to be here. It's going to be a fantastic. Uh, I watched a video clip. How many have uh, how many have heard us sing the song here, Hope of All Creation? Uh, it's, it's a great song. They wrote that song. The sheet music just came out to it, Brother Cam. Yeah. All right, so you're on that, right? Yeah. On it. All right. Uh, but uh, but there are one. You won't want to miss next week. He's while while they're singing, he plays up a tr picks up seven different instruments and starts playing all of them and sets one down, picks another one up right in the middle of the song. I mean. Just fantastic, um, uh, musically gifted people for the Lord. And so we want to make sure that everybody knows about that. That'll be next Sunday. Now you're dismissed. All right. And uh, thank you for being here today.